Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys as usual. So today I wanted to take a few minutes and answer some of the viewer questions about boa constrictors. And please keep the questions coming. I always like to do these segments and touch on some of the most relevant questions that are asked that hopefully will be informative to the whole viewership of this channel. And our first question, what are your thoughts on outdoor enclosures for boa constrictors? And I should mention that this is from someone who lives in Central America, which is the natural range of the boa constrictor, or at least the boa imperator as they're now referred to. So on the surface, it might seem like a good idea to keep your boa outdoors in a natural enclosure, especially if you live in an area where boa constrictors are native, because potentially the boa would be exposed to the natural environment in its home range, as well as sunlight and fresh air and other things like that. And you could also have a larger enclosure potentially than what you can do inside of your house. However, there are a lot of disadvantages to keeping a boa outside. Even though it is potentially the natural environment, you're not going to have nearly as much control over things like the weather and you know there could be a storm that moves through, there could be a heat wave, things like that that could damage your boa constrictor. Your boa constrictor could be preyed upon by predators that live in the area that happen to break into the cage. The animal could escape from the cage and go back into the environment. Or worse yet, it could be an invasive species if you're talking about living in an area where boa constrictors uh, don't naturally occur. Um, in addition, there have unfortunately been several cases recently um, of people who have been keeping animals outside and certain lowlifes have broken into their compounds, stolen animals, or worse yet, even killed animals. So when you keep an animal outside, it exposes it to a lot of risks that it's not going to be exposed to indoors. So what I would say is that if you're going to do this, be really careful. Consider the security and well-being of your animals on top of everything else. And if you can't provide for this 100%, I would say do not keep animals in outdoor enclosures. Okay, so our next question, are Christmas tree tubs big enough for a slow-grown adult boa constrictor imperator? And so the Christmas tree tubs are roughly around four and a half feet long by about 18 inches tall by about, you know, two feet deep. So they're kind of an unusual size and I actually made a rack to hold these tubs. I did a video on it not too long ago. Um, in general, these tubs can be used for animals up to about five and a half, maybe six feet. But really any animal larger than that should not be kept in one of these tubs. It needs a larger living space. And just because your boa is smaller than that size doesn't mean that it wouldn't benefit from a larger living space. So I would say you can keep the smaller boas, you know, like the dwarf boas in these tubs for their whole life. Or you can keep sub-adult boas that haven't reached larger than about five and a half feet in these tubs, but you can also keep them in other enclosures as well, which might give them a better environment. So I would say use them for animals that big as far as your sub-adult slow-grown BCI male. If it's under five and a half to six feet, you could keep it in one of these tubs. Okay, our next question. Is your family and kids interested in boa constrictors like you are? And so as you know, I have children and I've seen a lot of people who keep snakes. One of the things they enjoy the most is sharing their interests with their kids. And my kids are interested in snakes, but of course they're not nowhere near as interested as I am. So with me, I think I was just into it from a really early age. When I was like four or five, I saw um, some iguanas actually at my nursery school and something clicked in my brain saying, yes, I like reptiles and I've been pursuing it ever since. I don't think anything like that happens with my kids. I don't know if it's genetic or it's just some kind of environmental fluke or what. Um, I don't think the kids, my kids have the same level of interest in these animals as I do and I don't think they ever will. Um, but it's not really surprising since nobody else in my family, my siblings or my parents or cousins, none of them are into reptiles. It's only, I'm the only one that does it. So I don't know why people are interested in reptiles. Everybody's interested in a certain different things. I'm interested in a lot of other things, by the way. Um, so yeah, I don't know. You know, hopefully my kids will get more into it as they get older, but we'll just have to see what they enjoy doing. And next question. I can't help but notice a lot of your boas are so well handled. How much time do you spend handling them per snake? Okay. 
And so the short answer to that, to that question is it depends, but most of my snakes I don't really handle all that much. There's a few that I really like to handle that I'll probably take out a few times a week and you know handle them for 20 minutes or so. But the majority I really just handle when I'm doing their weekly maintenance routine. You know, I'll take them out and just visually examine them, make sure everything's going okay, um, you know, clean out their cage, etc. And really the majority of animals are just docile. They're not, they're, they just tend not to be aggressive by nature. There's only a small handful of bows that I have that are somewhat aggressive or bitey. And I don't make a habit of using those in the videos. And so I actually, I have some animals that are just, for whatever reason, really aggressive, especially as babies. And typically they tend to calm down as they get bigger. And one of them is a two-year-old female Peruvian red tail boa. Um, for whatever reason, she's just super aggressive. And, and when I open up her cage, she'll always strike out at me and I can't stick my hand in there without losing some blood. So in fact, I thought, yeah, I'll get her out for the video today, show the viewers, but I kind of chickened out. So I grabbed her brother instead. So this is the brother, the litter mate from that, of the uh, Peruvian female that's really aggressive. This guy, for whatever reason, doesn't bite at all. He's much more mellow, much more handleable. You know, I don't know what it is. Every snake's an individual and some just have their own personalities. So this guy, a nice two-year-old holdback uh, Peruvian true red tail. Real nice animal, doing real well. And in fact, I have the same pairing was set up this year and hopefully the female, his mother, is gravid this year with her second litter. So hopefully should have some full siblings to this guy on the ground in a few months time, you know, if luck goes my way. So stay tuned for that. Our next viewer question, I would love to hear about some of the super rare types of boa constrictor like Ortonii and Nebulosa. What are your experience with these animals? Well, so first of all, I just wanted to say that there are a few types of boa constrictors, subspecies of boa constrictors that are not available in the uh, reptile hobby, at least not in the U.S. And that includes the Ortonii, the, uh, it's a form of boa constrictor from Peru, and boa constrictor nebulosa, the clouded boa from the Dominican Republic. And um, I don't, first of all, I have no direct experience with these animals as far as I know. There are a few, if any, of these animals in the United States. I've heard some rumors that some of these may exist, specifically the nebulosa, that some people do have these animals and they're trying to breed them. But as of yet, I've seen no available animals. Um, I heard from a friend that he knew someone who actually had some of the nebulosa imported from Europe. There's some breeders in Europe working with them. And he paid a huge amount both for the import fees as well as the boas themselves and you know tried to set them up unfortunately they only lasted a few months and then died so that was the end of that so i believe that the nebulosa is still going in europe i'm pretty sure the ortonii is not um, there may be some people in peru you know the native range of this animal that are keeping them down there but you know i don't know firsthand but if anyone has any experience with any of these less common subspecies of boa constrictor, please comment below. I'd love to hear what your experience is. As far as some of the other rare forms, of course, there's lots of different locality specific boas that fall under one or more subspecies that we probably will never get in captivity. Um, but I think we're really lucky to have such a diversity of locality boas available of different species and subspecies. And I really, you know, you have to uh, just enjoy the diversity that we have. Um, I've got, you know, no less than six or seven different subspecies of boa in my collection. Um, and then, you know, within these subspecies, there's numerous different localities, you know, like the boa constrictor constrictor has the Suriname, the Peruvian, Venezuelan, etc. types of localities. So we should just enjoy the uh, diversity that we have. Uh, I know people always want to focus on the things they can't have, the forbidden fruit, so to speak, and wouldn't it be cool if we had this boa or that boa? But it's probably not likely to happen, so we should just really enjoy the animals that we have and really try to ensure that they are continued to be bred in herpeticulture so future generations of keepers can work with these. Okay, so next question. What is going on with the America Competes Reptile Ban? Will this pass? 
Okay, so if you've been living in a cave for like the last six months, you might not be aware there's this thing going on right now, which is called the America Competes Act, specifically the Lacey Act amendments buried within the America Competes Act. And so the American Competes Act on the surface is a bill in the, that passed the House of Representatives that's supposed to be about advancing American competitiveness in technology. But they managed to bury in, um, in the oh, close to 3,000 pages of the bill, they buried in a few pages that concern reptiles and exotic animals. And if this thing passes and becomes law, it could effectively ban the interstate transport of any species that's not uh, recognized domestic species like dog, cat, and a few others. So it would be a huge negative impact to reptile keeping and virtually every other type of exotic animal keeping. And I did a video on this previously, so check that one out. Also, you can go to the US ARC site, which is the best source of information. I'll put a link to the US ARC site in the description under this video. So what's the latest on this is that the bill did pass the House of Representatives and now it's went over to the Senate. And so there is a similar bill in the Senate which addresses much of the same content. So the next step is these two versions, the House of Representatives version and the Senate version, have to be reconciled into one bill. And that's where they'll, they'll go through the two competing bills and they'll decide which uh, they're gonna keep from each. So this is the time period where it's important that we continue to contact our senators and tell them about our opposition to the Lacey Act amendments and the America Competes bill. And of course, it's not the entire bill. Most of it is fine. It's just a few pages that deal with the amendments to the Lacey Act. Okay, so you please write them, call them, email them, tell them that you're opposed to the passage of these Lacey Act amendments that are buried within the America Competes Act. And in fact, if you go to the US ARC site, they have a whole a bunch of information. You can download a sample email that you can just send off to your senator. Really easy, it only takes five minutes. Um, and we really need to keep fighting this because if this passes, this is gonna be the end of reptile keeping, maybe for good, as well as the end of a lot of other exotic animal hobbies that people just love to do and just really depend on financially. So please continue to fight this ridiculous pending legislation. Okay, our next question, are hybrid cross boas of two or three species a good investment in your opinion? So this question actually has two parts. And so the first is just about hybrid boas, if that's a good idea. And so by hybrid, in this case, we're talking about species. We're talking about, for example, an anaconda crossed with a boa constrictor. And so you could also say that since boa constrictor imperator has been elevated to a full species of boa imperator, boa constrictor, like a true red tail, crossed with a boa imperator, that would be a species hybrid. So in general, I'm completely against this. I think it's just a bad idea because in the case of crossing the true red tail with the boa imperator, you would have a uh, intermediate, which many people might think is a true red tail, so the identity would be a little bit confused. But then the other issue is that once you cross two boas together of two different species, you could never regenerate the original species. So even if you crossed it back to the one species for multiple generations, there would still be a little bit of genetic contribution from the other species. So most purists would be completely against this. You know, as a pure locality boa keeper, this is not something that I agree with. If somebody thinks a hybrid looks cool, and you know, the only, uh, other than the boa imperator, boa constrictor, the only other boa hybrid I've seen is the anaconda crossed with a boa constrictor. And to me, that's just not a cool looking thing. Um, it's so distinctive looking, you wouldn't confuse it for either a boa constrictor or an anaconda. And in fact, they may well be sterile. A lot of interspecies hybrids like the mule, the horse and the donkey hybrid are sterile. So you're not gonna be able to breed it anyway. So if you want something like that for a pet and it just really floats your boat, you know, that's fine. Go for it, keep it as a pet. Um, the, the prices on some of these interspecies hybrids is kind of ridiculous. I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars for one of these hybrids. So again, I don't, it doesn't float my boat, but if it's something that you like, go for it. But then we get to the second part. Are these hybrids a good investment? And I first of all have to say that pretty much any boa constrictor is a bad investment 
if your if your primary reason is for financial gain. Okay, so if you mean investment as far as getting enjoyable hobby, getting scientific information, yeah, bull constrictors are a great investment. But from a purely financial perspective, there are far better investments out there, stock market, real estate, you know, Bitcoin. Um, and the vast majority of people that try to make money breeding boa constrictors are going to end up losing a lot of money. Um, I would say that as far as hybrid boas specifically, there's not a whole lot of people out there that want these things. And the majority of people want pure boas. They don't want any kind of hybrid. Um, in fact, most of you guys are watching this because you're into the pure locality boas, which is about 90% of what I do. And based on your comments, you want pure boas as pure as possible. Um, so I would say that it would be a really awful investment, you know, a scheme to make money by breeding hybrid boa constrictors. So please don't do it. All right, so that gets us to the next question. What is your biggest boa? And can you keep boas small by maintaining them in rack systems? Okay, so my biggest boa as of now is my Guiana female true red tail. She's about eight and a half feet or so. It's hard to measure her because she's kind of wild, but she's around eight and a half feet. The largest boas I've ever had, I had some Argentine boas that were maybe a tad bigger, maybe almost nine feet. Um, I've never had any boa bigger than that. You know, I know people think that these animals are giants, but you know, anything over eight feet is pretty rare. I've seen pictures of boas which are claimed to be in the 12, 13, 14 foot range. And that seems to be about the absolute maximum limit. But this is like a human who's seven and a half feet tall. It does happen, but it's like literally less than one in a million. It's just that freak of nature that just gets really big. Um, people like to fixate on this and there's all kinds of misconceptions about boa constrictor size. They, there was never a boa constrictor that was 18 feet as many books report that was actually an anaconda. Um, but people think that they're giants. The majority of boas as adults are somewhere in the 6 to 8 foot range unless it's a dwarf like this crawl key, which are more like the 4 to 6 foot range. So they're not giant animals. And the second question this person had about keeping them small in rack systems, no, you can't do that. You can't stunt a boa by keeping it in a small enclosure. I know like there was this myth about goldfish, you could keep a goldfish in a goldfish bowl and it would only get as big as the, as the aquarium. That's just not true. And it's really cruel to an animal to try to keep it small by restricting its movement in a small enclosure. So if you want a boa that doesn't get very large, go for one of the dwarf forms. Uh, you can keep them in a larger rack system like the one I have behind me. But as far as stunting them in a rack system, you, that you can't do that. Next question, what is the best method to sex boas? Can they be sexed visually? So I've actually done videos before on sexing, uh, which I'll refer you to for more details. But I would say that the, my preferred method is called palpation. And so basically you're just feeling the underside of the tail of a baby boa and with your thumb you kind of put some pressure on the bottom of the tail and you can feel the two hemipenes they feel like two little bumps okay and once you have a little bit of practice it's really easy to do this it's non-invasive you don't need any special equipment you can do it with just one person so that's what i recommend for baby boas up to about a year or so of age when they get older than that it, they become harder to sex by palpating them but the visual differences between the males and females become more and more obvious. And boas are one of the rare snakes that are really easy to sex visually just by looking at the tails. Okay, so the, first of all, the males have these spurs, these little claws that stick out. And in most adult males, they're anywhere from maybe three to six millimeters in length. So it's a visual, visible claw. The females will have them, but they're really, really tiny. Um, in some cases, you can't even see the spurs of the females. Okay, and once you see the big spurs, it's pretty obvious it's a male. And the other difference is the shape of the tail. The male's tail is much longer proportionally than the female's tail in an animal of the same size. And the male's tail is also fatter. Okay, so it'll be much, much fatter. And then there's a very uh, um, fast taper to the tip of the tail. Whereas the female is kind of more of an even taper over the whole tail. 
um, kind of more pointy towards the tip. And again, the, the tail of the male of the same size animal is about 50% or so longer. So if you have two animals together, uh, a pair of the same size and the same type of boa, you hold up the male on one side, the female on the other, and it's pretty obvious the difference between the tails of the two. And once you know the difference, you can pretty much tell from across the room just by looking. Next question, have you tried putting a small hide under the racks for escapees? And this was asked uh, after a video I did about a couple baby boas that had escaped on me. And so I'll say that I have tried this approach. Um, I have tried putting hides around the floor of my snake room. And usually I have a few that are just on the floor anyway because I have so many hides. But if I did have an escapee, I put them down in a systemic way to try to attract the animals to hide there. And so I'll say that this has never worked for any of my escapees. They just don't go to the hides. I don't know why. Um, what I've noticed though, when snakes escape from racks, is they tend to go up, not down. Okay, so snakes in the wild, boas, especially babies, will climb into trees, so they're more likely to climb up than climb down. So if you ever have an escaped boa, you definitely want to look up as, as much as you look down and look on upper shelves and behind books and you know things like that on top of refrigerator, for example they're pretty likely to go up rather than down. So it might make more sense actually to put the hides on top of the racks rather than underneath the racks. Okay, so a couple more questions. Uh, let's see. In addition to quail, are small lizards or house geckos a good alternative food item for boas? So a lot of boas in the wild do eat lizards, for example, iguanas. Uh, so it probably isn't a bad idea to try to feed them some lizards. Um, if you have access to lizards, you know, I know that house geckos are a feral invasive species in a lot of the country. That might be a good uh, food supplement to consider in addition to the rodents and small birds. Um, you probably want to freeze them ahead of time just to prevent any kind of parasite that might be living inside of these animals from infesting your boa. The other possible downside is that as reptile keepers, most of us don't want to feed another reptile to our reptile. So it just is a little more psychologically easy for us to feed the boas a rodent rather than to feed them another reptile like a lizard. Um, but other than that, they probably would make a decent food supplement to give to your boa. Of course, you probably wouldn't want to base the diet entirely on this. It's always best to have a diversity in the diet of you know small mammals and birds as well as some small lizards okay so our final question for today how can i buy one of your animals do you sell on morph market do you have a website okay so the best way to keep on top of my boa sales is to watch these videos because i do videos when i'm about to list animals for sale uh, so if you watch this is the first place you can see where new animals are going to be available. So I haven't done Morph Market in the past. Uh, it's possible I might in the future. There are some things about Morph Market that as it currently is, it, it wouldn't be my choice to sell reptiles there for a number of reasons. I've sold on Fauna Classifieds and I will often post animals there. That site has some issues as well. Um, one of the issues it has this really clunky message system that's really hard to use and sometimes I can't even reply to people on the message system. It's just a really buggy website. So from now on my fauna ads have, a, have an email address so you can contact me directly about an animal uh, just to preclude that issue. Um, and always, uh, like I said, I show animals on these videos that are going to be up for sale. So it's the best way to keep in touch with my uh, reptile sales. So I don't have a website specifically to the reptiles. Um, I'm on Facebook. I sometimes will list stuff there. I think this year what I might do is get a photo sharing type of website where I can just list all my available animals. I can give people links and they can go and they can see all the animals I have available in one place at one time. So I'm hoping to get that up once I have a, more animals on the ground. Um, hopefully I'll have the time. As you know, I have a lot of 
gravid females right now and I have a lot of stuff to keep up with. Uh, I might not have as much time to make these videos in the future, but um, just trying to you know keep doing it all. But hopefully I should have some time to make get these website up so you can see all the animals. And then uh, there's no, no uh, waiting lists or reservations. It's first come, first serve. And once the animals are ready to go, which is usually about a month and a half to two months after they're born, I sell them on a first come, first serve basis. So please stay tuned to future videos and hopefully you'll be able to get that animal that you've always wanted. So I hope this video was helpful. Keep, please keep the questions coming and I'll try to answer them as best I can. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.